Ireland was relatively poor compared to other European countries in the 90s. They attracted a lot of foreign investment in that period, and they grew very rapidly. A lot of multinationals started establishing their base in Ireland. In the late 90s, they were growing almost 10% a year on average. So it became this powerhouse. It was seen as the Irish miracle. Well, in my business, the real estate business, uh, we had dramatic growth, phenomenal growth, almost unbelievable growth year on year up to 2006, 2007. The uh, economy was overheating. Property was driving too many things. The downturn was largely a failure of finance. It created a classic real estate boom. A real estate bubble that just truly went haywire. So there was a massive construction boom. A very strong boom. During the boom. A lengthy boom period. Building boom. Property boom. Price boom and a construction boom. Biggest real estate bubble of any place in the world. When the bubble burst, uh, the building industry collapsed and a significant portion of the economy collapsed with it. Immediately, construction slowed down. There was no finance available. Mortgages began to show distress. Retail spending declined. Shops were laying off staff and closing down, unable to pay rents. There was devastation right across the sector. When the bust hit the economy, unemployment shot up. It peaked at around 15%. There was a, a danger uh, that Ireland you know, could actually go into a spiral like in other countries. The Irish economy suffered a really very, very big contraction by any historical comparison. There was a lot at stake in the sense that the banking system was profoundly dysfunctional. To lose credibility in that environment, it would have had a very severe long-term effect on employment and the prospects for recovery. When the crisis first hit, the government panicked and guaranteed all this debt. And suddenly, all this debt ended up in the hands of the taxpayer. By early 2009, the government had laid out a multi-year program of fiscal adjustment. They were hoping that this was a temporary panic. It actually turned out the banks were in deep financial trouble because they'd made all these loans for real estate. And real estate prices went down by 60%. Around September, October 2010, this was a banking system that was having a cardiac arrest. Why then? Because it was two years after the initial post layman's guarantee that was put in in Ireland. And so there was a funding cliff. The markets began to get very nervous and they would not extend new loans. So this is a bank run. There was one day in November when a billion euros of retail money left the banking system. The game was up. So at that stage, it was becoming less likely that Ireland would be able to fund itself, the state or the banking system, in the following year. Banks were unable to finance themselves. And it was clear that something had to be done. It was a, a classic moment for appealing to the IMF for financial assistance. You're in, in a crisis, and you've got the tick-tock of a billion dollars a day leaving the banks. The priority became to address that hemorrhage. So the Troika arrived in Ireland in December 2010, made up of the European Commission, the European Central Bank, and really importantly, the IMF. The IMF was in the mix because it had long and deep experience of these kinds of crises and of these kinds of programs. This is the bread and butter business of the IMF. We need to have an international dimension for what was a difficulty within the European Union more widely. The European Union could have done this all with their own money. They didn't actually need the IMF's money, they just needed the IMF's imprimatur and technical expertise. The IMF team, they had much more experience in this kind of an operation. None of the European institutions had ever done this before. So the fund was definitely the most experienced of the three uh, constituent parts of the Troika. What did we hope to get from the IMF and from the Troika? 
The way I put it at the time, in speaking publicly, was that the IMF were going to provide a protection for Ireland against the vagaries of the international financial market. This is what was on offer. The, the funding for a three-year period during which the adjustment could take place. The most important thing that needed to be done was to stabilize the banks. If they did not manage to stabilize the banks, nothing else would work. The Troika's idea on that was to do a very intensive stress test. The key measure was to bring in an external neutral party to come do an asset quality review and a diagnostic of what was happening in the banks because what the Irish had done before did not have sufficient credibility. If you don't do it properly, you prolong the uncertainty and you never stop the bank run. It made an enormous amount of difference that the IMF was supervising it because they were viewed as being independent. They had a depth of knowledge that was not available to us elsewhere, so I think that was by far the strongest thing they brought to the party. Once we managed to establish that the hole in the banking system wasn't some crazy number, that helped stabilize the situation. And you know, I come from India, and in India we have this concept of arranged marriages versus love marriages, and this was an arranged marriage. The IMF, the European Commission, and the European Central Bank, these three institutions were not used to working together. I wouldn't say that we all fell in love with each other, but we learned how to coexist. It was very clear that there were different opinions within the Troika. So that's what the Troika was. The bailout was clearly controversial in, in many ways. One of the big things was around how the creditors in the banking system were dealt with. I think the biggest political controversy was on the issue of senior bondholders. And there were clear differences of views uh, between the Irish authorities and the Troika and within the Troika on that issue. Why should the Irish taxpayer on their own uh, bear this excessive burden of supporting European stability? but it led to constant butting of heads and there was a certain visible tension. We were very much in favor of these senior creditors bearing losses, but in the end, the ECB did not allow them to do that. So that was probably the single most controversial aspect of the entire bailout uh, period. Austerity was not a choice. It was a reflection of necessity. The contentious issue was between the fund and the European Central Bank. The ECB in particular at the beginning were pushing for fa even faster austerity, which we felt would kill off the economy altogether. You know, we did manage to convince the European Commission to, uh, and the ECB to back off a little bit. I think they wanted even harsher austerity to begin with. Much of the heavy lifting on fiscal had actually been done before the Troika got involved. That meant that when the programme discussion started, we already had a plan of action in mind. And they'd done a very good job of putting together a proposal of how much they were going to cut government spending, how much they were going to raise taxes. Within taxation, what taxes? And within spending, what, what uh, spending adjustments? Now, on the particular choice of measures, we left this to the Irish authorities to choose. So they were able to respect the political decisions of the Irish system. That was very important because it gave them ownership of the budget measures that they implemented. If you have to give four different pay cuts to your public service, you have to make sure that the public service understand why you're doing it. And you certainly can't do it because some outsider said so. Communications about the choice of policies was a central element of what we were doing. They captured the confidence of the nation and people said, oh, these guys are actually, they are here to help us. 
the economy had hit close to bottom by the end of 2010. It was a very, very severe slowdown. And it stayed down at bottom for another uh, two years. But we had to really kind of drive and really look at our competitiveness and take some very, very difficult decisions in terms of our footprint in Ireland and how we operate it. From 2010 on, it heralded a period of caution and reduced consumer spend. So we had to cope with all of that inside our business. Between 2007 and 2012, we uh, reduced our number of breweries from three to one, for example. Our challenge was to control our costs and remain competitive at the same time. The recovery in the Irish economy began in late 2012 when the labour market turned around. We had a period of two consecutive uh, quarters of growth in employment. So less than a year after the Troika came in, we made a decision to invest almost 200 million euro in our infrastructure. We also invested 170 million euro in a new brewery in 2012. Thankfully our business has returned to very solid growth. We're fitter, leaner, very focused on our customers. That's how we focused and evolved and as a result we have been able to grow our business nationally and internationally. So this is a very steady and sustained recovery. It's a, it's a bounce back. I look at the state of the Irish economy today, almost full employment, our reputation abroad, the respect our, our businesses are held in. The financial crisis could have destroyed that reputation. So the real great work of the IMF and the other Troika partners was to stabilise Ireland, to kick on again. That was what was at stake, I think, in the downturn. That's why we appealed quickly to the IMF to turn that around but the wider confidence in the uh, vitality and dynamism of the economy was not lost. Ooh, we can see so